Hey everyone, you're about to hear and also watch if you're on YouTube and ARC's podcast. I'm Cole, one of the hosts of said podcast, and I have a couple things I want to say before we get to the good stuff, if you'll allow me. If you're coming to this video from my YouTube channel and you know nothing about ARCs, you should definitely, definitely check it out. It is an incredibly fun game, both in the base and campaign modes, and I'll include some links for you to check out in the description so you can get started with ARCs, and then you can come back and enjoy this podcast. This podcast is about the Blighted Reach campaign expansion. If you're looking for base game content, you can check out the Space Cats Peace Turtles podcast. They do great stuff. And that's it. Without further ado, we'll jump right into the podcast where we are introducing ourselves and talking about what we like about ARCs. Enjoy. What do we like about ARCs? And I'm, we're going to introduce ourselves as we do this. I'm Cole. Uh, and what I like about ARCs, specifically the thing that I thought was coolest about ARCs when I first played it, was the way that the game is scored and the way that like the actions flow. I think it's really cool because you're declaring the scoring conditions that affect the whole table, but you give something up every time you do so. So you're kind of betting on yourself. In most cases, there can be some exceptions where you declare an ambition, uh, not really expecting to win it. But generally, you're betting on yourself that you're going to be able to win this with uh, a little bit of a disadvantage throughout the rest of the scoring period. Additionally, I really like the trick-taking action system. I feel like it's restrictive enough that you have to come up with a unique plan for every hand you get, but I think it has enough workarounds and uh, different ways of interacting with it that it doesn't feel like insanely restrictive, if that makes sense. I think they, they struck a really good balance there. My name's Christian, and something I really like about ARCs is the scoring system. Um, in comparison to Root, specifically, um, you can, in, in Root, frequently what happens is like somebody gets to 25 points and they need five more to win, as I'm sure you're familiar. And they can kind of just get that passively, like through the last two turns by just like crafting an item or doing something completely meaningless. In Arc, you can completely lock people out of scoring. And you can also score a ridiculous number of points in the final chapter if you really lock in and go for it. It's very true doesn't ever feel like you're completely out of the game. Huge. I am Perry from Cole's Root Channel, and I don't really like arcs. I'll be the sort of foil to the rest of the people on the podcast who do like arcs. Because you love arcs. Because I love <laughs> arcs, but only because one of the fates that we'll talk about eventually is called the Believer, so we often, when it enters into our game, sing songs based on its name. Thank you. I rest my case. Uh, I'm Jamie. I... Oh, man, now all I, all I can think about are those Believer <laughs> songs. <laughs> like, that's all I can think about. Uh, the thing that I like about arcs, I just feel like the, the way that you take actions feels so much more fun in this game than in Root. I specifically love, you guys know, the court. Oh, yeah. Anytime I can get my hand on a new guild card or something, I don't know, I, I just feel like the the action economy, it, it flows a lot better. I feel like uh, Root, you can get stuck in the same molds more easily. We call her the court freak, actually. She, like, really... Sue me. Gets <laughs> Uh, yeah, the other thing I like about Arx's uh, turn system is, like, it's way snappier than Root. Like, you take a turn, and the action itself is so much shorter than, like, a full turn of Root, or especially, like, Oath, where the turns are, like, massive. Uh, and then it just goes to the next person. And you're, you're, you're way more engaged, I think, in other people's turns because it's coming back to you so quickly. Uh, and I think it makes it a lot easier to stay, like, in the flow of the game. Um, I do notice, besides Perry's joke about the Believer songs, that we all did talk about stuff we like about the base game. And that's because, I mean, honestly, the campaign game is just like a really cool framework that's like grafted on to the base game. Um, but in terms of the campaign specifically, I feel like what I really wanted from Oath was a game where like you finish a game, and then you're talking about it like, oh man, I can't wait to see what's going to happen next. You know, there's so many possibities. Uh, and I feel like that never really happened for Oath. 
because each game was kind of like a self-contained little episode, if you want to call it that, and then like the next one was kind of just like a hard reset. I know like some stuff changes, but it doesn't really feel the same. In arcs, the amount of different ways the board can be built up or completely destroyed and people's fates can progress or, oh, now I have this card and I've brought it to this fate. I wonder how that's going to work out. Oh, Christian got this card with this fate. I think that's going to be really strong or, you know, I feel like there's a lot of just thinking about this game. Like it takes over your brain in a way that even Root never did for me. Here we are doing a podcast about it. <laughs> it speaks for itself. And a lot of other people are doing podcasts too. Um... So yeah, uh, the, the sort of conceit of this podcast is that we are going to spend an episode talking about each of the 24 fates and arcs. Uh, as you know, there are 8 A fates, 8 B fates, and 8 C fates, so the A fate episodes are going to be a bit on the longer side, and the C fate episodes might be a bit on the shorter side. And today, we're starting with the steward. So I guess we should also clarify before we actually start talking about the steward our own experiences with the steward. Um, so like, I personally have played as the steward twice in two different campaigns. In one campaign, I pivoted off the steward after act one, and in the other campaign, I played them all the way through act three. I have never played the steward, and I'm not particularly interested either. Do not like the steward, do not play, like playing with it. And this is real, I was joking when I said I don't like arcs. Steward, not a fan. I feel like you should give it a try. Because I said the same thing about Magnate before I played Magnate, and then I was like, you know what, actually, it's really cool. Obviously, I'm going to give it a try, because I have to play all the A-Fates as soon as possible. But... We're not we doing don't this. need to get into yeah, this right yeah, we're now. Not doing we this. really don't. You, um, you threw that in there just to get all of those head shakes. <laughs> we'll talk about it soon. I'm we don't sure have to. we will. My first campaign ever, I played as the steward, and I had a lot of fun. Although I did pivot off of it. Uh, in Act 3 to play the survivalist, I think. And you play the steward again. And I played it again later, and I think I failed in the second act. I completely forget what I pivoted to. I have not played the steward at all. No. I'm not that interested in it, but I am going to play it eventually. I think I had it as an option recently. No, it was the partisan. Uh, but I didn't pick it. So anyway, the steward. The steward is described by Dr. Worley as having to hold together a fragmenting empire while navigating fractious court politics. In Act 1, their path to power is to assert their authority by winning ambitions as the first regent. In the second act, their path to power is to extend the empire's control and fill the imperial trust. And in the third act, they must solidify the empire's control over outlaw cities and fill the imperial trust as the first regent. Rated a 2 complexity out of 3. The first act, you start with between 14 and 20 points um, on your... I actually don't know what the correct word for it is. It's like a, your objective marker. Your objective marker, yeah. Each time you win an ambition while you're the first regent, you advance one for each power that you gained from the ambition. You count bonus city power, too. There's reminder text about that. Right. So, this... Um, it's interesting because all the other A fates that want to win ambitions, which, like we talked about in the Magnate episode, is everyone but the Magnate, uh, they don't care how many points they win from the ambition. They just care that they win the ambition. But the steward specifically is trying to declare and win those high value ambitions. So that's interesting. We have a couple of uh, cards that we get in Act One as a steward that sort of equip us for this job. Anybody Ooh, want to be? Give me that one. On oh, that, yeah. you know, the Jamie one? really likes the one. <laughs> you can. Have one. I love the card art for Imperial Authority. So this is a lore card. This is the first card you get. Uh, you bury it if you're an outlaw. You may tax any cities controlled by the Empire like they are loyal, ignoring the Empire's presence and truce laws. Do not take captives. That's a pretty good card, I think. Certainly. Yeah. Uh, it's a lure card as well, um, so you can't steal it. No one can steal it. Uh, if you ever become an outlaw, it goes away, but, I mean, let's be real. If the steward's becoming an outlaw, they're failing their objective so hard. Yes. Um, so, it's pretty good. It's great for gaining resources that you do need to win those ambitions, so you can kind of be competitive for winning Tycoon, Empath, and Keeper all at the same time if the cities are in the right place, where usually the other players are probably going to only be competitive for one of them at the start of the game, which is a pretty big advantage. 
Uh, just keep in mind you do need a fresh Imperial ship in the system to use it because it needs to be Imperial controlled, not just have Empire presence. Yes. The other thing you get when you start off as the steward is Deal Makers, which is a psionic guild card, protected, which means it can't be raided, that reads uh, Bargain, which replaces your secure action. Choose a court card that a rival could secure. They secure it for return agents they would capture. You influence once for each agent they had on the card. Then you secure once. Now, frankly, I think the deal makers might be the best guild or lore card that any fate gets when they start their game. Now, this is funny <laughs> for everyone. It'll be funny when the Magnet episode. <laughs> If you watch the Magnate episode, you will understand why this is funny happening after we recorded the Magnate yeah. episode. But obviously dealmakers, like, being able to influence and secure on the same turn is always going to be good. That's why having Sonics and Relics be able to do so when you when somebody leaves the mobile or admin card is so huge. And here, like, you can do that after you see something flip. You can capture something that has some agents on it already by moving somebody else's agents. Yeah. Incredible card. You can use... Can you use a, a relic to do that, though? It doesn't have to be a... Yes. Card, yeah. The and, and we aggression will, card, right? Yeah. You want a lot of relics for the steward. Um, yeah, I, this card is just straight up broken. I mean, <laughs> protected cards, more specifically than just not being able to be raided, they can only leave your play area if you provoke outrage of their type. So they can't be stolen by any means. You can't be prompted to discard them. Even if, like, Diplomatic Fiasco would discard it, you can't do it. You must keep it. You do lose this card no matter what if you fail your act one objective. Correct. So definitely but look out for that. It goes into the court deck. Yeah, but, right, but you'd prefer then, to just keep yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, better to keep it. If no, you succeed uh, and pivot, though, you still keep it. I, yes. I, I understand. I'm just saying there's still opportunity there. It just is scarier. Yeah. I like. I understand why the steward has it because they are like completely tied to the first regency and they need some sort of advantage in being able to secure it but like it is so good in every court situation it has so many applications beyond just securing the imperial council uh yeah probably the best card in the game which is uh pretty good because we're starting out with it so you guys get an idea of where the goodness of cards goes from here you can compare to the bar that is deal makers plus the little man's mouth on the dealmaker's card is funny. I like his little smirk. Not as much as Imperial Authority. Though. Yeah, the guy on Imperial Authority is really funny. No, I don't care about the guy on Imperial Authority. The uh, steward just looks cool. Okay. Sorry. Well, so, agree so, like, the, the way we're going to do each act is we're going to break down the kit, which is what we just did, the abilities and cards that they get, and then in the Act 2 and Act 3 section, any cards that they add to, you know, edicts, the court deck... In between acts. Then we're going to talk about general strategy for the act, then notable cards to look out for during that act, matchups to look out for during the act, and then pivots that you might want to make at the end of the act. So we can go to general strategy now. What do you guys think you want to do when you're starting a game as the steward? Win ambitions. <laughs> it doesn't even matter. You can do whatever you want and you'll win. Just, yeah. Whoa. It's really, I think, very hard. It's on you to like fail the first act. I feel. Um, See, I disagree. If well, as the game you know is out longer and people understand the power that deal makers has, I think people might conspire to make you fail, or if they just don't like the empire being in the game that much. That being said, with deal makers, you can just secure basically any court card as soon as it comes up uh, for free, almost free. Lets you win like tycoon, um, empath, keeper, pro. A little bit yeah. easier than that. You can also secure the Imperial Council like a hundred times in a row, which lets you tax everything away, which lets you also win ambitions. Well, I mean, to secure the Imperial Council over and over again, you have to flip it back up at a summit, which then opens someone else up to taking it. But yeah, yeah. but even just like one good tax of getting like two psionics, if, if it's on peace already, or if it's on type um, escalation, the edict. Mm -hmm. Getting two fuel in, in Act One kind of puts you so far ahead in terms of tycoon and. Yeah, um, Keeper. I think the steward obviously is very strong compared to the other eight fates, and that's kind of the point. Um, but I think like as people are playing and as we we have been playing, we've certainly realized that the steward is very strong, and keeping deal makers is enough of a buff 
that I think the whole table should just be like, screw this guy. Let's try and make him fail at all costs. And it's going to be hard. I'm not saying it's going to be easy to make them fail, but I don't think it's like a walk in the park for the steward to succeed. You guys saw the last game I played. Uh, I We had that chapter one where no ambitions were scored because populist demands crisis. Mm. I barely succeeded that time because I had to get the bonus city power in chapter three. Um, but yeah, it, it's not so, quite so cut and dry. Um, in terms of setup... I do think getting a relic city as soon as possible is just going to make your life way easier. If you can't do it in setup itself, you want to get your starport down, get your ships out and blast out to the nearest relic planet, put a city there, get those relics going because you get more secure actions, which gets you more deal makers. and deal makers, as we just discussed, is broken. You also don't technically need the relic city yourself because of Imperial Authority. Right. It's just more can... reliable, I think. It, yeah, it's more reliable. Because they could always but... move the ship out, you know. Um, and then beyond that, your primary goal is to secure the Imperial Council as quickly as possible. The time that you're most vulnerable in the game is the start when there are no agents on the Imperial Council and it is on the white in session side. So you want to put agents on it as quickly as possible to dissuade people from doing it and then proceed to securing it as quickly as you can. Uh, if someone does have the mindset that I think I do now have of let's fail the steward, you know, ASAP. Uh, and decides to influence the council with multiple agents, I think that's where you kind of use deal makers as an actual deal making card, like it suggests. <laughs> uh, you know, something like who wants a free card? Uh, Christian just put two agents on the Imperial Council. I can't surpass to put more agents down, I can only copy to put one. If someone puts two agents on, if someone surpasses and puts agents on another card, then I'll deal make that card for you. You get a free card, and then I'll secure the council. And if People like free cards. They'll probably go along with it. I, for one, like free cards, generally. Mm. I love the court. I'm the court freak. Yeah, she is the court freak. Uh, So, like, it does kind of call for some sort of buy-in from the whole table for trying to fail the steward, I think. Because if someone breaks rank and says, you know what, I do want that free lore card or whatever, then you're probably just going to get your agents captured and your plan is thwarted that quickly. Um, and then I think you probably do want to just keep the Imperial Council on the decided side. Uh, cause you don't really need to trigger edicts a bunch in act one to win ambitions. They're going to come up by virtue of the dice rolls anyway, at some point, most likely. And you're strong enough that you're going to be getting guild cards to win ambitions at some point. Anyway, you have the best chance of winning tyrant because you have deal makers. You have a lot of advantages. I don't think you need to be exposing yourself to potentially getting the first Regency stolen, and especially never do it if someone else has access to both psionics and relics, because then they can do it in one turn before you even get a chance to contest them on their secure of the council. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I just really agree with that. Yeah. (laughs) Um, And then I do think a secondary goal for Act 2 is just to get a lot of Imperial ships on the board, because... Do you mean like a goal... For Act 1, going into Act 2? Sorry, sorry, that you want to establish going into Act 2. Uh, Imperial ships? Yeah, you mean? because this, this... Isn't that what I said? Imperial ships? Yes. yes. I, oh, I thought you just said ships. No, Imperial It's not ships. really important. Yeah. We're sorry. talking about Imperial ships here, for clarity's sake. The, uh, the steward likes them. Does the steward have any special way to put Imperial ships down like the Admiral does? No. So if the game doesn't start on policy of escalation, that first time you, should, you secure the council... You should change it to Escalation, definitely. Okay. And Escalation is the one that gathers fuel crates and Weapons. rockets from... Okay. Yeah. I think it has a double synergy with um, the Steward because it helps them win Tycoon while... Remember, the First Regent does have to pay the Imperial demand themselves. Um, so you can just not pick up material and fuel and you want relics anyway. So you're going to have a good job winning Keeper with the relics that you collect... And you're going to have a good job winning Tycoon with the demand that you collect. And you're not going to have to pay into the trust as long as, you know, you're spending whatever material and fuel you do decide to tax before you call edicts. Yeah, I do think that basically every time you should try to secure the council as fast as possible and always make an escalation. Yeah. You probably will be leading in points. Uh, and like I said before, people are going to try and get you to fail so you don't get to keep deal makers because they might want it themselves. 
first regency in general is just good to have yeah that's a that's an incentive on its own people get progress towards ambitions they can generate favors from their rivals um and then they're immune to the tax as well if they you know play it like i just described uh because they're kind of more in control of how it happens um and i think if you can't hold on to the first regency through uh one chapter it's not the end of the world you just have to get it back as soon as possible give someone a deal maybe uh to flip the council back to in session at a summit you know maybe say if you call this summit and flip the council to in session i'll give you a favor or something like that maybe even two you know some kind of deal because you do need the first regency uh 100% 100% in order to succeed as a steward. You're, you're tied to it. I do think, too, though, if you have an opportunity to get the bonus city power in, like, Act 2 through whatever means necessary, I think that, that would be good if you think you'll be able to win an ambition with the First Regency still, if it'll set you up for, like, if you're able to finish it Act 2, especially, because that way there's not going to be any kind of Act 3 forcing the steward to fail through, like, finagling with getting the First Regency back at the end. Because I you're, think you're saying you're saying chapter two and chapter three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In chapter two, I think you should not be afraid necessarily of putting too many cities out. Like, you know, people may not want to do that because they're afraid of getting raided or spreading themselves too thin. Inviting that, I wouldn't worry about it as the steward. I think that if you can succeed on your objective through doing that, you should always do it. I think it's also safer if you have an escalation already because you just keep stacking all your cities with purple ships um, yeah. whenever Edix comes up. Yeah. And then even if they do, you know, someone leaves the Empire, they still have to attack through three purple ships, they probably just won't do it. Yeah, I think it's um I think the the larger concern is probably being taxed, uh, more so than raiding, because people don't necessarily want to generate outrage in Act One unless they're the partisan. Uh fear the partisan, uh they will destroy your city and ransack the court because they already have outrage love the partisan yeah extra cities are also going to be useful in act two i think so why not just put them out now especially if you do lose the first regency for one chapter you probably are going to need bonus city power if you're not like vacuuming up all the ambitions in a chapter anyway so you can go for it uh you don't need it but it's probably not going to hurt you like perry said because you're able to protect them with those imperial ships um, and I think the last thing you want to do is try to read the table and gauge how likely players are to leave the Empire. Because having many Imperial ships out can be annoying for an outlaw, and it might dissuade them. But if you're collecting the Imperial demand like two or three times a chapter with uh, event cards and securing the council, some people might just decide they'd rather not deal with it and get out of the tax. So you kind of have to way like exactly where everyone's at in terms of that because the steward really cares about who's in the empire and who's not uh and you definitely prefer that everyone does stay in the empire because it benefits you more than them it's another reason not to flip it back over after you secure the council too because even if you are the one to secure it again if you are collecting that tax a lot it'll be more of a problem for those people that have to keep paying it so even though it seems like you're losing something, if it's making people think less about leaving the Empire, that's good. Yeah, and there's there's other ways to do this. Like if people are really annoyed that you're collecting the demand this time, like ask them which resource would they prefer that you take. Like do they want you to take the fuel or the weapon? And then if they say the weapon, just take the weapon. Unless you like really need the fuel to win Tycoon to succeed your objective. You're trying to like keep keep the uh, the tensions light, you know? Don't... Uh, don't this go too hard on him. Familiar. I I was psychologically manipulated last game. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what you're referring to. I just I, you like totally did that uh, when you played the steward. Oh. All three acts. Yeah, I'm not, I I'm not surprised by that. I'm just I'm like. I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it psychological manipulation. I was just trying to be like you know friendly and amiable <laughs> towards my fellow players to further your own agenda. Yeah. Well, yeah. Everyone's got their own agenda, buddy. It's arcs. Okay. Notable cards. What do you guys think cards the steward wants to keep an eye out for in the court? All of them. They can have all of them. Just take them all. No, 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 no. Council, <laughs> council intrigue, maybe. Yeah, they council intrigue is the top of my list for sure. Yeah. Um, as soon as it comes up, put as many agents on it as physically possible, I think. And then Maybe not as many it. agents as possible, because then possible. people might want to ransack the court on you, especially if you have like undefended cities. 
Yeah, I'm thinking more like you put like three if you can, and then just immediately next turn secure it and secure again if that's possible, or do whatever you need to. Hundred percent, because if the crisis happens and you don't have any agents on it, then it's just then you're undefended. Chaos, and anyone can get the first regency. Although if so other people bad. stack it, it's not too bad either, because you can. Um, did you get them? No. <laughs> good. This is good. Sorry, what were you saying? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think if other people stack it, it's not too bad either, because you can always, um, can't you deal make it and then have them, or no, no sorry, they get to choose where to put it. They, they get, get to choose, choose the target, yeah, which very sorry. well might be the council. Gotcha. Yeah, you definitely want to contest on council intrigue uh, if other people are influencing it, because you really have no other choice. Uh, second one, and I, I alluded to this a little bit, is populist demands, because the crisis effect will remove an ambition marker. And if it's one that you're counting on to advance your objective, that is really bad. So try and secure that, and then maybe use it to double declare that ambition that you want to win instead of potentially risking getting that uh, one removed. Song of Freedom as well. You probably are going to be leading, which means Song of Freedom Crisis is probably going to affect you. So I would say probably just try and secure it quickly. Um, you can leverage it if you have a loyal ship in an empire-controlled system with another player's city. You can replace their city and seize the initiative that way. Uh, because you control all empire-controlled systems on your turn as a regent. Uh, sometimes, though, it can be good uh, to just remove one of your own cities that has become a liability, those ones that are less defended and someone might be gearing up to raid. Uh, so you can use it that way as well. Uh, Silver Tongues, you're going to get a lot of good cards. People are going to want your good cards. I wouldn't let them have Silver Tongues if you can help it. Finally, a guild card. We're talking about all these Vox cards. Is wait, is Swardians in base in like the? Yeah, Sworn Guardians is also on this list because it protects you from Silver Tongues and also counts towards Keeper, which you should already be pretty good at winning. It'll lock down Keeper a little bit more. Uh, and then the last one I have is Diplomatic Fiasco. Though you don't necessarily need agents in the court to be securing cards, just still be wary of leaving them tied up there because your guild count can get pretty high pretty quick and you might lose track. Don't make that face. They can get a lot of guild cards. I don't think that the steward needs to be too worried about Diplomatic Fiasco in Act 1. Diplomatic I'm saying keep an eye on it. No one else needs to worry about it. The steward probably should because there's a chance that it does actually happen, which I don't think will happen to any of the other fates in Act 1. The steward's not going to be have to give in favors to the... Yeah, yeah. Agency. No, I put that on here. They don't need to give up favors most of the time, probably. Uh, but, you know... If you're doing a strategy like Christian just suggested where you're you know, putting a bunch of agents on council intrigue, it can happen, so just be aware of it. Um, and maybe just you know, think of that one card that you don't really care if you lose. Uh, lore cards, I mean, there are a few. Um, it was kind of hard to pick out any like specifically good ones. I do think that both of the Keeper-related ones are good. Uh, Keeper's Solidarity and Keeper's Trust because you're probably going to be declaring Keeper a lot and they rely on Keeper being declared. Uh, let me just pull up so I can read specifically what they do to you, uh, or for you. Uh, <laughs> keepers. <Wow. laughs> what have they done? I was going to read to you what they do. Hmm. Keepers trust. While keepers declared, rivals cannot steal resources from you that are the same as resources they already have. You can also discard this to clear relic outrage, which would be good if something like the planet breakers in the game. Also, super obvious great synergy with Swardians if you are able to pick that up. Uh, no, that's Keeper Solidarity you're thinking of. This is Rivals Cannot Steal Resources From You that are the same as resources they have already. Wait, what was the other one you just read? No, that's the same thing. <laughs> you're confusing it with Keeper Solidarity, which I haven't read yet. Okay, okay. Which says, Let while Keeper is declared, Rivals Cannot Steal Guild Cards From You while you have any resources of the same type. In parentheses, if you have both Relics and Sworn Guardians, neither can be stolen. Okay, I'm there now. Yeah. The other two I picked out are Warlord's Cruelty. While Warlord is declared, you may tax cities that you already taxed this turn. You have access to taxing a lot of cities. Double taxing, triple taxing a city that you really want is good. Um, and then Tyrant's Ego. While Tyrant is declared, you may spend captives in your prelude, returning them to secure once for each. You're going to get captives with dealmakers, and then you can spend those captives to get more secures, which you want for dealmakers. Yeah, I forget that dealmakers gives you captives too. What a busted card. Yeah. And then there's also Tool Priest, kind of, which lets you, uh, for the build action, once per turn, build one ship at any city that you control, even rival cities. Um, you might not have that many starports. And so just being able to build extra ships um, 
when you have a construction card is also good. Oh, who cares? Let's talk about some like juicy stuff. Like sprinter drives. No. Sprinter I, drives. Everyone wants sprinter drives. We're not going to talk about sprinter drives. <laughs> uh, How dare you? Don't bring up sprinter drives. Everyone cards wants like sprinter that. drives. Everyone wants, you know, like living structures. And that's, unless there's like a really specific synergy with those, I don't really think they're worth bringing up. Um, those are just really good cards. Yeah. It's a rough topic for Cole. <laughs> <laughs> Matchups. What do you guys think? Yeah, Admiral is your friend sometimes. That's yeah, the Admiral's the big one to talk about, but there are a couple other ones. Um, any thoughts? We'll definitely talk about the Admiral. I mean, I don't like when the stewards in the game is any other fate, so they'll all probably oh. want you dead. I mean, Advocate and Believer are both attaching stuff in the court a lot in Act 1, and you're securing stuff a lot, so you can really take advantage of that. That's yeah. true. Yeah, I did. I did note down the believer saying you have many opportunities to, to secure those faithful cards that they add to the court with your deal makers. They're also going to probably be really sweating completing their objectives, so you might be able to cut a deal with them that involves each of you getting a faithful card if they teach twice or something like that. I didn't put down the advocate, but that is a very good point. Uh, also, the founder is just by very nature going to be opposed to you because they have to be an outlaw. It seems to me like there are two types of founder players. Uh, ones that are going to stay as far away from the Empire as possible and just hide in the corner, and ones that are going to start swinging on the first turn and trying to cut down the Imperial presence right away. If you're dealing with the former, you probably don't really have to care about the founder that much. If you're dealing with the latter, you're going to need to be violent in response. And because the founder gets to become an outlaw on their terms, like within their turn, uh, thanks to parade fleets, they're pretty much always going to have the opportunity to throw the first punch if they want to. You just can't really let yourself get caught off guard by it. Maybe, you know, shore up your important buildings a little more than you normally would. One Imperial ship might not be enough to protect it. I think when we're talking about Act 1, though, what fates have positive synergy with the steward isn't as important. Because, like, sure, the Believer's going to attach cards. We're not going to know the Believer's in the game when we're picking the steward. Like... I think it's more important to think about what fates we want to be going into the next few acts. Like, the Believer, I don't think I'd have any problem taking with me into Act 2. But the Founder, I think, would be a worse one to let succeed. It's, uh, it's tricky. I, I, think, um, I, I think the synergistic matchups are still nice to pay attention to because when you're aware of certain things like that, you can get pretty good benefits like those faithful cards can be really huge for winning yeah. ambitions um yeah i mean i guess if you can make the founder fail you can try to you're probably going to be fighting them anyway so i guess try for it there's really no downside if you're already confident you're going to be completing your objective just try not to deplete your fleet too much because you will need it for act two um and now we have to talk about the admiral of course the other empire focused fate the Admiral needs edicts to be called, and they need to be winning an ambition when that happens. The only way for them to guarantee edicts being called is to secure the Imperial Council. So that's bad news for you right off the jump. You're going to have to try and cooperate with them, I think. Just know that since you can't guarantee edicts without securing the Council, you might have to petition the Council and leave yourself a bit more vulnerable to then secure it again for them and call edicts, you know, to appease them a little bit. And with the Admiral's cooperation, you should be able to use dealmakers to secure it whenever your own agents aren't enough, right? Normally, the problem with leaving the council in session is that the other players can cooperate to try and prevent you from securing it again. If the Admiral's in the game, you have someone that's equally as vested as you are in getting those edicts called by you, and so they're probably going to be more likely to help you out because you can call it again for them and they know that you have that consistency. It's a bit early to be talking about this, but Admiral is going to become a problem if they make it to Act 3 for you. And when I say a problem, I mean like a really big problem. Uh, so it would be preferable if they failed before then. You just gotta keep up the pretense of cooperation for the first act, um, so they're not like just constantly trying to take the first regency from you, because that's gonna be really annoying. Um, other people don't need it, the Admiral kinda needs it, and so they're probably gonna just go for it. Um, and you might be tempted to cause the Admiral to fail Act 1 at the last second. I sure would. But consider what happens if they succeed. Rogue Admirals gets added to the court deck, which is a card that basically makes stewards' objectives like five times easier. It's so good. 
And I think it's really it's worth cooperating with the Admiral through Act 1 and then trying to fail them in Act 2 instead because of how good Rogue Admirals is. And also Rogue Admirals makes you immune to the whole Admiral problem in Act 3 if you're able to secure it, which you probably can. So how many copies of Rogue Admirals are added? Two. And what does that one do again? It lets you ignore Imperial Presence, Movement, and Truce Laws. And you're immune to Martial Law in Act 3 if you hold it. Okay. So it's basically just completely does what the Admiral does, but even better, and then is immune to the Admiral's gimmick in Act 3. Additionally, if they fail, they add the Imperial Defectors Vox card, which replace outlaw ships, or replace Imperial ships with outlaw ships, uh, which is also bad. So they're still going to add them if they fail Act 2, but hopefully by that point you'll have a lot more Imperial ships and it won't matter as much. Um, I think Rogue Admirals is enough of a boon that you probably do want to help them succeed Act 1. I mean, do you really want to roll the dice on the Admiral making it to Act 3, though? I think so. Because it's just that good of a card. The, on- the Really, the only problem Stewart has in Acts 2 and 3 is the fact that they have to have their own ships to move all those Imperial ships around. If they don't have to do that, it makes it like really easy. At least that's my opinion. I understand that. It's just, like, the Admiral is such a weight on the steward's shoulders that I feel like... You're not in s- Act 1, though. No, no, I'm saying for the future Acts that I think if you have an opportunity to fail them, there are definitely times when that's still worth taking. I just think it's going to be hard to time that in Act 1 anyway, whereas in Act 2 you can, you know, move their Imperial ships into the gates so they're not controlling planets... Use deal makers to prevent them from capturing any regents, uh, and there probably won't be any outlaws because if they kill outlaw stuff and take them as trophies, they get objective points. So it's gonna make it you can make it hard for them on all three of their objective fronts. Um, whereas in Act One, you know what can you really do? Not call edicts. Other other than that, you don't really have that much influence over their objective progress. And if you don't call edicts, they're just gonna get mad at you and try to secure the Imperial Council. So you can also just wait until the end of Act Two and then. If you didn't fail the Admiral, you just pivot off a of steward. Yep. I think the steward's very powerful to pivot off of because all their cards just say, like, do bonkers stuff. They don't have, like, anything that they really lose by pivoting. Yeah. that's. I think that's definitely true. That's um, not something I considered. I don't, if usually, you're, sorry, <laughs> I don't if you're, usually pivot. If you're yeah. talking about just playing through the steward A fate, though, yes, you must probably make the Admiral fail at the end of Act 2. Yeah, if you can't make the Admiral fail and you don't have Rogue Admirals you're going to want to switch. If you can't make the Admiral fail and you do have Rogue Admirals, it doesn't really matter as long as you keep Rogue Admirals. And that's that, I think. I and, did honestly forget you could fit off of it in the third act that I do think it would be fine to let the Admiral hang in act two. It's amazing how playing the way that you do cuts out like half of the strategy involved in playing the fate. So in terms of pivots, speaking of, uh, I really think if you succeed, you can do whatever you want. Dealmakers is going to be good for pretty much any fate that you decide to pivot to. And of course, it will still be great if you decide to stay. The consideration I would make when deciding whether or not to stay is just how many Imperial ships do you have out on the board? If you weren't able to trigger policy of escalation that many times, or if the founder or someone else who decided to go outlaw early destroyed a lot of Imperial ships, then you might want to consider pivoting because you need a lot of them for Act 2. Yeah. And you have no like way to get a lot of them at once. Um, if you failed... There are a few B fates that I think could be good. We talked about this a bit in the Magnate episode. Um, that hasn't come out yet. But a strong empire is really beloved by the planet breaker because it allows them to break planets essentially unopposed. I think that's very strong. Uh, Warden, especially if you try to get those extra cities out, but you couldn't quite make it across the finish line, those extra cities are now going to help you set up those fiefs as the Warden. The Hegemon has to prevent rivals from winning Tyrant in Act 3. Dealmakers makes that really easy. And Peacekeeper wants to be the first regent because they have to control planets, and you're probably the first regent. So that's good, too. I guess if you failed, you might not be the first regent. But Dealmakers is like specifically designed to let you become the first regent. So it's still good. So, sorry, you're saying if you fail the objective, then probably Founder... Or not Founder... Um... What was the one you just said? All four of them. If you fail, those would be the ones I would be more inclined to pick. If you fail, you'd still go for Peacekeeper and... Well, Hegemon 
Didn't you say? Ay, Dios mio. Uh, Whoa. Oh <laughs> I forgot God. I was wearing that. Didn't you say hegemon? <laughs> the floor, man. Hegemon, part of what makes it good is dealmaker. So if dealmakers goes back into the court oh, deck, yeah. it's not going to be yes. as good. You could still potentially get it back, but it's not. That's true. So maybe not the hegemon. Uh, but if you succeed and you get the hegemon, you know. What were the four you just said again? Planet Breaker, Warden, Peacekeeper, hegemon, hegemon, and Peacekeeper. Yeah, the Warden is a good one to go to if you fail. The Planet Breaker is a good one to go to if you fail. I think the Hedgeman and the Peacekeeper are better if you succeed because of the Dealmakers thing. Well, that's a wrap on the Stew Act 1. And now we move on to Stew 2. And we'll let it stew, everything that we've just... Let it you know. linger. Yeah. yeah, if you want to take a break and let oh. it stew, we understand. You <laughs> followed our guide to a T. You've done incredibly well. You've succeeded Act 1. You're moving to Act 2 after completing your objective. What's going to happen is you're going to add another copy of Council Intrigue. Bad. And then Tax Collectors and Hunter Squads to the court deck. Those are cards that just generally make it not fun to be an outlaw. Just a little deterrence that the steward has to the court deck, which can be nice. Um, specifically, the Tax Collectors is a relic suited guild card that says, Bury this if you're an outlaw. When you tax an outlaw city, you may take the resource from their player board. And the Hunter Squads is a weapon suit that says, when attacking an outlaw in battle, you may re-roll assault dice up to your total weapons, resources, and cards. Uh, and then additionally, you're going to add the Imperial Protector's Law to the rule booklet, which says that blight crises do not happen in systems controlled by the Empire. Which I'm sorry, that wasn't at you. The fly landed on my head. You looked like you had a I figured it wasn't for a second. You were like, Pfft. that was good. So those are the little goodies you get for succeeding. And then you have your Act 2 objective. You start with 22 objective points. Uh, first way you tick down is with Expand the Empire. At the end of each chapter, if you're the first region, advance once for each cluster where the Empire controls any systems. The second way is ensure the Emperor's Tribute. At the end of each chapter, advance once for each resource in the First Regent's Imperial Trust. You advance this way even if you're not First Regent. Yeah, this one's the Cakewalk Express. I, who's going to fail this? It's only a Cakewalk if your Act 1 went well. If you didn't get many Imperial ships out, it's going to be pretty rough. Even if you didn't get many Imperial ships out, there's like what? Like... Eight of them to start? Yeah. That's enough for every well, cluster. Well, the problem is no one ever decides to be an outlaw. And if I'm planning as a steward, I'm probably going to become an outlaw. But you guys just never want to. Hey, I've done it like twice. Jamie has become an outlaw, but also twice. doesn't battle the Empire. Yeah, I don't battle. So... Well, it is nice if the steward succeeds to be able to hide behind the Imperial ships when Blight Crises are rolled. Yeah. And other players, too. I mean, they're already nice to hide behind if blight, cri blight crises are rolled, so you probably don't care anyway if you've already decided to become an outlaw. You gain one card? Yes, or, the yeah. Imperial Quorum Edict. Yeah. Or, as Ethan likes to call it, the Imperium Quirium. This causes you to resolve the effects of Edict 3, govern the Imperial Reach, which is what we say when we're talking about co collecting the Imperial Demand, and the you resolve it in this way. So first, the first regent collects the demand. Then second, the regent with the most starports built may, optionally, take the imperial action. And if it's tied, you skip it. And then third, the regent with the most cities built may change the policy of Edict 3. On a tie, you skip it. So you really don't have much control over the imperial action anymore unless you have the most starports or most cities or both i'm going to say you probably won't have the most starports and there's a good chance you won't have the most cities especially if there's a flagship in play because for some reason the cities on flagships count <laughs> even though they're not really cities um easy there tiger and so well this doesn't seem mad. fair it's, it's it's on your head no way so really ah! here stay very still oh <laughs> Just whack yourself in the head. It'll work. Did you do like a Cole's Root Channel The Fly episode from Breaking it, Bad? I was going to interrupt you when first we first... Put the camera up there. Yeah, and just have us like chase the fly around the room for an hour. When we first started, you were like motioning with the fly swatter. 
And I was going to interrupt you to say that it was making me nervous. Me and DM, we were kind of like on edge because mm. you were flinging that swatter yeah. all around. Swatting that swatter. I'm on edge now. I'm ready, I'm ready to swat in a moment's notice. <laughs> this fly is uh, derailing it. But yeah, it doesn't really... Like, I understand, like, they want the flagships to interact with it, but if they're not going to count as cities on the board for, like, anything else, why do they count for the Imperial Quorum? It doesn't really make sense to me. It's, like, really easy to get five cities on your flagship. To make the steward's job harder. I guess, but, like, they should really have to, you know, put the a little st- elbow grease into it, I think. No, the steward call. should put some elbow grease in. They don't really But they can't, because the they max out the starports, like, very easily, and then you literally can't, even if you put five starports on the board, even... Yeah, you just, just attack the ship. Who cares? It's not escalation. It. Just leave it. That's the it ideal m- setup. Well, the other person could change it off either. escalation. Well, if you're tied on cities, I mean. Okay. But then you also but you have, have to, to be, be tied on cities right away. Tied on star or more than tied on Star Force to even place the thing from escalation. So. Yeah, it's pretty rough. Um, just forget about the edicts. If there's a flagship. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, people probably aren't going to give you the Imperial ships, and they. Probably aren't. They might change the policy, I guess, um, to something else. But uh, really, you're just going to be getting the resources from it, most likely, if there's a flagship in the game. Otherwise, you know, you can interact with it like normal. So I guess that brings us to the general strategy for Act 2. Perry thinks it's a cakewalk. I do think it's the easiest of Steward's three acts. Really, you just continue to secure the council to collect Imperial demand and fill the trust. If you're able to fill it enough early on, it won't be the end of the world if Arrival becomes the first regent, which is nice. But you do want to try and get it back by the end of the act because you want it going into Act Three. Uh, I would also, you know, secondarily secure those tax collectors and hunter squads cards if they come up. Other players probably aren't interested in them. That aren't you anyway. And you can use those cards to give anyone who's thinking about securing the Imperial Council to steal from the trust second thoughts because then you kind of are more imposing towards them. Like the moving ships around is like a thing you can honestly do like last second with the last card or two. Yeah, if it works out nicely. Um, You definitely want to move those Imperial ships into as many clusters as possible. All of the gates, specifically, is going to be great for your objective. It's the easiest to do. They're all connected to each other. And also helps facilitate regent movement and restrict outlaw movement, further incentivizing everyone to stay in the Empire. Do keep in mind you have to be the first regent to advance this way still. Uh, And it really wouldn't hurt to kill the Blight in the gates, too, if we're like trying to sell this unrestricted Imperial movement thing because then it really is unrestricted movement through the gates if all the Blight's dead. Yeah. And you have the spare actions to do that, this act, so oh, yeah, really, do. why not? Other players fighting over the first Regency, if you lose it, is good for you. They're probably going to do it once, that, once you do lose it. It opens the door for you to get it back. You encourage them to call summits in order to petition the council, like we talked about in Act 1. It's just not as urgent now if you're able to get the resources in the trust. You can kind of gauge based on, you know, how many points you're going to be scoring in Chapter 1 where you need to be going for Chapters 2 and 3. Even if you somehow scored zero in the first one, which I think is, like, basically impossible, it would be really hard to do, um, you're still going to have a, a good chance, I think, if you can, you know, get your stuff together for X, or Chapters 2 and 3. What is the thing that allows someone to put three Imperial ships in a place without Imperial ships? Is that is that, that in a place without that... Imperial ships? Yeah. Or oh, it, it's with Imperial ships. Yeah, it's Sorry. two. Sorry, it's I two got in an Imperial controlled system. Yeah. yeah. And is that from that card? It's from the policy of escalation, which that... can be enforced by this. So the person with the most starports may decide not to place the ships if escalation is in place. But that doesn't normally that doesn't happen before you get that card, right? Am I no? Incorrect. No, it the three policies before. are they rotate depending on if you decide to change it. And they always have an Imperial action. In Act One and in any game without the steward, it's mandatory that if you collect the demand you also enforce the action. So it's the Imperial it's the, the first regent that does it unless that card is in play. Yes. Okay. I just the have to clear that up. Yeah. My uh, experience with the first regent and the, the steward are limited. Yeah, Jamie doesn't really like the first Regency or battling. She really doesn't like any of the good parts of arcs. Court deck. <laughs> court, court deck. deck. But in campaign court deck is kind of rough. Yeah, it's brutal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, definitely, definitely beware of outlaws securing the council. That's probably the only way your objective really gets in jeopardy this act. The first Regent, which is probably you, is going to lose power from that happening. 
You're also going to lose that objective progress because your resources that you spent a long time building up by calling edicts are just going to disappear. Definitely uh, double down on those imperial intimidation methods that we discussed with the ships in all the gates, securing those uh, empire benefiting outlaw scaring cards, get those. <laughs> Uh, and people probably, hopefully, won't want to be outlaws in the first place, unless the founders of the game, in which case, beat them up, I guess. We'll talk about it in matchups. I will say, I don't think it matters too much who secures those cards, right? Because if you're an outlaw, you bury them anyway. Yeah. So outlaws aren't going to secure them. If another region secures them, great. No, they just probably don't want to. So you're right, probably going to want to do it somebody yourself. else were trying to angle for it, it's not a situation where you should be like, oh, I want that card, I should try and take no, it. No, no, no. If the... somebody has it. They're awesome. not, like, insanely good or anything. They're just, like, pretty good. They're decent if there's an outlaw in the game. I really think they're better used as deterrents than actual cards. Exactly, yeah. I do think this is a fate where it's worth mentioning. It's quite possible for you to score a lot of points through Act 2, and you might get a pretty big lead, because the steward is really good at doing that. Try not to have too much of a lead, because then everyone might switch to sea fates, and you really do not want that. Because your, your wheelhouse is scoring a lot of points, and if the battle is happening on your terms, and you can score those points in Act 3 and they actually matter, great. You're in a great spot. If more than one person is like, ooh, I don't know if I can beat the steward on, with all these points, I'm going to go to a sea fate, now you're out of your comfort zone. And it's, it's much more up in the air as to whether or not you're going to have a good chance at winning. Well, and, if you've got two parries in the game... True. You're pretty much yeah. locked in. Uh, notable cards, like we talked about earlier, definitely Rogue Admirals. Makes the rest of your game so much easier in pretty much every way. Ignoring movement and presence laws is going to help you expand your Imperial presence. Uh, and ignoring truce law is going to give you an easy source of captives by taxing other regions. You want to immediately prioritize this card. Just drop everything and get it as soon as possible. Yeah, that's one you should definitely contest. Yeah. Uh, Prison Wardens, which is added by the Magnate, uh, is going to give you another way to interact with captives, and you're good at getting captives. So, pretty good. Especially if you get Rogue Admirals. Yeah. Imperial Defectors is bad for you. Uh, secure this card before someone who wants to weaken the Empire is able to, uh, and be aware that the existence of this card in the deck at all might make it more attractive for rivals to become outlaws, because it can become a source for them to get ships. Could you remind me what that, that card does? Yeah, let me read the exact text to you. Thank you. If Admiral fails either Act 1 or Act 2, they add two copies of the Imperial Defector's Vox card. When secured, you may discard this card or resolve the crisis in a cluster of your choice. The crisis effect is, in the rolled cluster, replace all Imperial ships with ships of the outlaw earliest in turn order, and then bury this card so it comes back. Gotcha. And there's two copies of it, so not good. Yeah. going to be a lot of ships that you spent a long time getting, turning back into non-Imperial ships, and like we said before, if you're not the regent with the most starports, there's really, unless the admiral's in the game, they're probably not going to be placing more ships for you. Secret Order, uh, caused by the Failed Believer, allows you to declare Keeper, which is probably your strongest ambition, without placing the zero marker. Not placing the zero marker is just always good. It's also a psionic, which goes with dealmakers, gives you more progress towards Empath. That's nice too. I know we don't normally talk about uh, three-player games, but I do think holding on to the initiative in that way is much more valuable in three-player games because there are a few people to seize. Also, the partisan is in the game. With partisan seizing, it's better because people don't partisan seize as often as they tuck a card to seize. Sure. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, what do you guys think some matchups to look out for are? We are trying to put ships in gates and get resources on the trust, really, is all. Now you should kill the Admiral for sure. Well, you can't really kill him, but you can try and get him to fail. That's yeah, we can, we, can, we, can go, we can talk about the Admiral first. Um, like we already talked about, if you don't have Rogue Admirals, Act 3 Admirals are going to completely shut you down. Martial law means you won't be able to use any of the Imperial ships that you spent all this time building up. You just can't use them for anything. Uh, if the Admiral's in the game, you probably want to try and just bunch up all the Imperial ships... Which does directly work against your objective, but it makes the Admiral do all the ship moving work themselves. Don't make it easier for them. Uh, and then in that, they're going to be bringing ships into 
other clusters for you and just giving you objective progress as they work towards it. But just make them do the work, really. You will have to collect the Imperial Demand to succeed a lot this way if you're bunching up the ships because you're not getting much progress for cluster control early on. Uh, chances are the Admiral will get you, like I said, a few of those Imperial Control related points though. Um, the Admiral only gets credit for Imperial Controlled Planets, so specifically in this matchup the Gates are even more important for you to want to control. Uh, obviously if you can secure Rogue Admirals, do it. Uh, use Dealmakers to prevent the Admiral from securing captives from rival Regents whenever you can. They get two per captive that they get from a Regent, so if they capture like three Rival region agents, that's six objective progress. That's huge. Don't let them do it. Oh, yeah. On the bright side, Admiral makes it really unattractive for people to become outlaws because they directly get objective progress from hunting them down. So that's good because you want everyone to be a region in Act 3. That's your ideal scenario. It's not likely because people are having their own agendas at this point and they are probably growing tired of the Empire. But if you can... If you can get them to stay by fear, it's just as good as you getting them to stay by being friendly. So That's what Machiavelli said. Yeah. And that's really the steward in a nutshell. They kind of look alike, too. I think so. Uh, the founder. The Machiavellian steward. The Machiavellian steward. Don't tell they me you don't alike. see it. I, I don't frequently pull up pictures of Never mind. He had blue skin, long red hair. I... Only on one side, though. He was no Oh, friend. right. Yeah. yeah. He's Italian. <laughs> uh, I have to cut that out, Cole. <laughs> <laughs> now that you said that, I have to leave it in. I feel like... Uh, for the founder, we still got to talk about them. Uh, the Commonwealth, you probably just want to leave it right away. Uh, you want to be able to fight the outlaws when you have to, and the armistice is going to prevent that if everyone's in the Commonwealth. Plus, you have a bunch of guild cards and Imperial Trust resources if you're the first region. If anyone's going to win the Commonwealth ambition without being in the Commonwealth, it's the steward. So just leave. Yeah, but you were just talking about how you don't want to get too big of a lead, and leaving the Commonwealth like right away as the steward seems like you would put a huge target on your back. Well, I'm not saying you have to win the Commonwealth Ambition. I'm saying it's the real reason is to be able to fight the outlaws. If the Founder's in the Commonwealth and calls Armistice, then you just can't fight them. Then they can do something like secure the card with the Armistice and Prelude with a Relic and then just blast the shit out of you after they've already moved into your system previously. You don't want that to happen. You you just want to be able to stay in control of your own destiny. And so not being in the Commonwealth is the best way to do that. Also, winning Commonwealth Ambition like at a critical point where it would cause the Founder to succeed on their objective is very good, even if it doesn't put you more points ahead. The Founder will still be an outlaw even if they fail. Yeah, but they won't be the Founder. They might try and become a Regent again. Maybe. I don't know. I don't know. I don't get, know. It depends on how they pivot. I don't know. If you get like the however many points, it's like thirty or forty, or whatever for what? winning the, from a double declared combo. That's position, what I'm right? saying. You know, oh, um, yeah. Then you, you just get... take the next two chapters off and just yeah, if do whatever. You <laughs> want. If they're double they declaring the, the Commonwealth ambition against the steward, they're fucking city asking bonus. For yeah, double, no, that's what I'm saying. triple yeah, yeah. declare Commonwealth. <laughs> Leave the Commonwealth and then. Yeah. Dude, if the founder makes the objective like. Keeper or Tycoon, like, what is he even doing, man? Like, yeah, you also being out of the Commonwealth, like, restricts their founder's options for declaring certain ambitions, which is also good, I think. Uh, Planet Breaker, I might be biased because this happened in our last game, but the Planet Breaker can target you specifically and use all the <laughs> ships that you put out to break a psionic planet and get rid of dealmakers, which I think they should do. The steward deserves it. It's like, <laughs> yeah, it's just like really easy. So try and make it as unattractive for them to be in the Empire as possible. Just collect the demand over and over again, secure the council over and over again if you can do it, and try and make those uh, demand collections as harmful to the Planet Breaker specifically as possible. Use every favor you get, take everything you can from the Planet Breaker, try and force them out of the Empire, and then you might have a chance at keeping deal makers. The other strategy for trying to keep dealmakers against the planet breaker is building cities on every psionic planet. 
because then they can't harm your cities because they're in the Empire. Mm. If there's a psionic planet with a free city on it and no other slots, you're out of luck. You can't do that. That's interesting. The Planet Breaker's little hammer thing they put down before they nuke a planet? Yeah. Is there any way to remove that? No. Okay, so yeah, you really got to get crafty to stop that stuff from happening. Yeah, it's really it's really up to the Planet Breaker if you're relentlessly taxing them, if they decide it's worth it for their game. Like, do they really need to get rid of Dealing Breakers that badly, or should they just give up and move on to something easier? Phew, thank God we got out of that awkward section. There was, like, a lot of tension in the room during it's that part. Not awkward or tense. Cute. Like... <laughs> Huge elephant in the room. I Not an so elephant glad. in the room. Pirate is another really big one to keep an eye out for. They just want to steal resources. You know where they can steal resources from? The Imperial Trust. They have an infinite resource slot card that they put all their resources on when they steal from the Imperial Trust. So normally they're, an outlaw stealing is limited by open resource slots. The pirate has infinite of them. So if you have like eight resources and you're sitting pretty and then the pirate gets the council, back to zero. Gone. In this dust that was a city. Yeah. 99 resources go by. Yeah. You just can't let it happen. Um, there's an extra copy of Council Intrigue, so you need to pay extra close attention to both of those in a game with the pirate because the pirate should be looking for every opportunity to secure the council and take those resources. Uh, and then the last two are Peacekeeper and Warden. Um, both of them want to control systems. The first Regency makes it really easy to control systems for the purposes of objective points. Yep. So they're going to want it. They're going to try and get it, probably. Uh, you might have to put a little more effort into defending it than you otherwise would. And that's that. Now we move on to pivots. What do you guys think? Pivots? <laughs> we miss you, Rick. <laughs> he's Rick never gonna see this. Gonna he's this. not gonna watch this. He's not gonna watch this. That's the best part. He won't even oh. read like a sentence long text. <laughs> <laughs> There's no way. You could oh. send him that clip. It's like he 10 seconds long. It. He will not watch it. No. Put on like 800 times speed and send it to him. <laughs> what do you think of this, Rick? Mail him a copy. Mail him a DVD of Elf. And then hard code the podcast into the middle of it. It'll catch him <laughs> off guard. Now we're thinking. He really likes Elf. That's he's what we'll do elf. after this. Yeah. He's that seen, makes sense. He's seen Elf well over a hundred times. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. You kind of look like you got a little elf hat. It's the spirit yeah. of Rick. Yeah, and you have like the blonde elfin hair. Elfin. <laughs> the ears too. You got the ears. I do. <laughs> So right, pivots. We can move past this, yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. <laughs> what do you guys think? Pivots. Not the. Wait. We're waiting. We're in sea fate thinking. territory. Here. Yes. In terms of sea fate pivot, I forget the name. It's the blight one for Act Three. The where you have to control blight systems. Mm -hmm. If you're the first regent, it's really easy. And also, the um, law that you add makes it so that blight crises don't hurt you. So. You really, if you succeeded in Act two with the steward and you've kept it sufficiently close that you think probably not that many people are thinking going to sea fates there's really only two that you want to consider switching to because really i don't think you need to switch to a sea fate unless you have to with the steward because they have you know if you're in a good position to do your grand ambitions just stick with it i think uh the judge would be one of those because the judge is pretty much only a good pivot if you have a strong position and an ability to win ambitions Steward usually checks those boxes, um, so Judge is good for that. Imperial Authority allows you to tax several resources, which you can use to tie ambitions. Dealmakers makes it easier to get captives, which you can also use to tie ambitions. I would just be wary of accumulating too many resources in the Imperial Trust that you make it like impossible to tie the ambitions. But this is stuff you're going to, again, if you've succeeded Act 2. Who am I kidding? We're playing the Steward. Please go on. No, I really think the judge is a good choice if you draw it. Because you only draw one, but if you draw it, I think going right. back no, three. He was saying what happens if you fail, who's going oh. to pivot to? Well, no, <laughs> that's not going to happen. He's like, probably that's not going to happen. It's definitely possible, um, especially if there are multiple outlaws in the game, making it more difficult for you fighting your Imperial ships, which again, doesn't happen in our games because nobody wants to be an outlaw when the steward's in the game. We barely haven't experienced this. It does happen. Outlaws will fight the steward, destroy the Imperial ships, in those systems and they don't control them anymore, they have a hard time completing it. 
Um, so Judge is good. Conspirator also good if you succeed because the Conspirator, one of the main counterplay mechanisms to the Conspirator is securing Vox cards from the court, which allow you to guess their conspiracies. Dealmakers lets you defend them really all day. Uh, so pretty good. If you failed, I would still consider picking those first. They're still very good. The remaining options probably aren't worth picking unless you did fail and are forced to pick them. Uh, I think the Redeemer is good. Uh, you probably still have access to a lot of relics uh, and you can control relic cities with Imperial ships. You do need to control relic cities to even tax them, your loyal ones specifically as the Redeemer. So Stuart is setting you up nicely for that. I think Redeemer is, is one of the better calls if you failed especially. Yeah. Naturalist, like Christian said, blight crises are prevented in systems with Imperial ships. But to use this strategy, you really need to cling to the first regency like your life depends on it because you won't control the systems if you're not the first region. Thankfully, you get to keep deal makers if you fail act two. So you can hopefully do that. But you really cannot afford to lose it because then you have no synergy with uh, the naturalist at all and it's just like you're playing it from scratch. Uh, additionally, the gate wraith cares about winning ambitions. Stewart is good at winning ambitions. Uh, they love being the first region as well to control the twisted passage for their objective. Uh, if you failed, you might not be the first regent, but again, keeping dealmakers gives you a good chance of getting it back. Gate Wraith, additionally, very cool. Yeah. Underrated consideration, yeah. I would consider that. In fact, if it comes up at all, you should probably take it. Probably. No matter what fate you're on. I don't actually think, I think <laughs> Gate Wraith's kind of overtuned and like not actually that cool, but I do think the idea of them is very cool. What is that? Like Overtuned is just more reason to pick it whenever it comes up. I mean, sure, but like that doesn't make them cool. That makes them it's kind of like the moles, like kind of just like lame at that point. Um, I do think they're like way cooler than the moles, obviously. To be clear, obviously. Um, but I do think they're like definitely, definitely the strongest sea fate by like a good bit. And we'll talk about them in episode twenty-two. So keep an eye out for that. Uh, so that brings us to Act Three with the steward, the lovely, lovely steward. What's this one called again? The Steward's Two Grand Ambitions in Act 3 are be a regent while the Empire controls all outlaw cities, or there are no outlaws, and you're the first regent and the Imperial Trust has more resources than the current chapter. Again, pshaw. That, no shot, dude. <laughs> There's this an is, outlaw that is, this is tricky. worse for me. I'm sorry. I'm just. I feel like the first thing we like did not react to that at all the last time that we saw Steward Act Three, and I. Do well, think... the thing is, there were two flagships, right? Yeah. Yeah. Flagships don't count for that. You need to be cities yeah. on the board. Yeah, because when there's a flagship, you there's can't no put cities on the board. Control. Yeah. If there's flagships, it's your lucky day, Steward. Yeah, it's not. Rel it's not easy to do this if there are outlaws. There probably will and should be outlaws by Act 3 at this point. Additionally, uh, keeping up with the chapter number for the Imperial Demand is like a little trickier than it sounds because you do actually have to be able to call the edicts, which means you're probably going to want to flip the council back to in session to try and guarantee it, which leaves you more vulnerable to it being secured. Perry's never played the steward, so don't actually listen to anything he says. You're coming on really strong about a lot of these things. <laughs> the also, um, if you don't have the most cities, they're probably going to flip it to policy of peace. Or no, sorry. Policy of war, and then you actually can't collect things onto the first regent's imperial trust. Well, if you're not the first regent, then well, you're not scoring that anyway. This well, is, if, if you call it as first regent, you go to collect demands, and they flip it to um, whoever has the most cities flips it to policy of war. Oh, yeah, like exactly. the trophy instead. Of it. Yeah, he doesn't thought, help you. He's talking about if you lose the first regency, and then the new first regent changes the policy. I, know, I, I just would just be embarrassed. I just forgot about the <laughs> Is all if you that have happens, things. you yeah. should feel shame. The the thing that you were thinking. Mm -hmm. Let it be known. <laughs> Uh, yeah, the, the nice thing is that we're going to add a few things in between acts again. And one of those things actually does let the first region set the policy. So if it's not on one that collects resources, you can set it to one that collects resources, assuming you're the first region. Uh, so in terms of the kit itself, we have the Imperial Sponsorship Edict. That's uh, a small purple badge. It is. Well, it's a small red seal on a small purple tile. 
And the first regent during edicts must place the sponsor token on an undeclared ambition box. If it's already placed, they may keep it on the current one. Then they may optionally add one resource they have to the Imperial Trust. This is actually going to be your most consistent way to get resources in the Trust, though you wouldn't prefer it. Uh, when a player declares a sponsored ambition, they must take one resource from the Imperial Trust. That sucks. Gain the power for second place on the placed ambition marker and return the sponsored token to the first Regent tile. If they are an outlaw, they become a Regent. Okay? Additionally, we now replace the three Govern the Imperial Reach Edicts with Govern with Authority. And basically what they do is uh, allow the first region to now collect demands from outlaws with a loyal city or flagship controlled by the Empire in addition to regents, and the Imperial action gets juiced up. So the policy of escalation now places four ships instead of two for the Imperial action. The policy of peace points that are scored for uncovered city power are doubled. And policy of war, you get to distribute one weapon and any one resource to each region from the supply. Okay. Now, if you're the first regent, you actually get to choose which one of these is the starting policy going into Act 3. And I'm going to recommend that you probably, probably want to pick Escalation. Agreed. And like Christian said, if you don't have the most cities, this is probably the only chance you're going to get to set the policy for the rest of the game. So you have to make the most use of it early on before anyone has a chance to change it. Policy of War, out of the question because you're trying to fill the Imperial Trust. There are situations where you might want policy of peace, um, depending on if you think it'll give you more resources than escalation, depending on what players are sort of specced into resource-wise. Yep. But definitely consider if you don't have many cities out, or especially if there are flagships in the game, you don't want to do the policy of peace because then the region with the most cities built, or whoever gets to do it, uh, starports built, whoever gets to enforce it, if they have those cities out too, so probably a flagship, they're just going to spam the points and get a bunch of them every time edicts are called, which is bad. So at least make them change it to peace first. <laughs> Remember that besides the Imperial sponsorship, outlaws can also rejoin the Empire through the Invite to Empire action in a summit. You can just, as the first region, offer them to rejoin the Empire. You can you know, put anything in to sweeten the pot that you might want. You'll probably have to sweeten it a lot at this point. They're probably pretty set in their ways by Act 3, but it never doesn't hurt to ask, you know? That's why the steward's nickname in Act 3 is the Honey Pot. So you're just going to say the Pot Sweetener. I've heard that too. Pot of yeah. Honey. Pot of Gold. Honey plot. About that. We're losing the plot here. We're losing the honey plot. Uh, yeah, so if there are too many outlaw cities for you to reasonably control them all, and you think you need all of your grand ambition scoring to win, which you might not because regular ambitions still exist and you're very, very good at winning them, uh, you probably want to attempt to make a deal for them to rejoin the Empire. You can attempt to say, hey, policy of peace is good. You have a lot of these cities that I can't control. You can actually use them to score a bunch of points if you become a regent. And I'm like going to let you do that. So just come on in. And, and that's if, the honey pot. Yeah. And if they're still not convinced, you can always offer them resources and stuff. But you really don't want to give them resources because you need it for your grand ambition. So really only agree to trading the resources in this deal if you're confident that the trust will have those resources without you adding your own, I would say. If there are outlaw cities, which again, there probably will be, and you can't convince them to rejoin the Empire, you probably want to back off from attempting to control those cities early on in the act because the Grand Ambition isn't worth that many points anyway. And what's an outlaw going to do if you put a freaking ship right on their city? They're going to beat it up and kill it. Yes, and then you are. can't get them back because no one is going to let you get more ships. Why would they do that? So instead, you want to try and move those ships into outlaw cities as close to the end of Chapter 3 specifically, I think, as possible. Because Chapter 3 is really when winning both Grand Ambitions starts to matter. And then you want to try and punch in the start of Act 4 to avoid them damaging your ships in Chapter 4 as much as you can. If you didn't uh, manage to dissuade people from switching to Sea Fates, stopping them is going to be on you pretty much because you're probably leading. Uh, and that can be difficult if there, are, if there are regents in this strong empire that you did create. So really, again, just want to emphasize, try and avoid that situation. If you have to sandbag Act 2... It might not feel good, but it's probably the right call for the long run. And then keep an extra close eye on your first regency against the Sea Fates, which we're going to discuss in a minute, because a lot of them get a lot of benefit from being the first region. Such as Gate Rape. 
Yes, that's one of them. Um, notable cards. Let's talk about those really quick. Any ideas or thoughts? Notable cards. I really didn't put out that many. Act three, there's just so many things that could be up there. Like I looked through all of them. <laughs> there's actually not that many because it's like in Act two, there's six, there's fifteen other fates. They like add like one or two cards if they succeed or fail, and most of them really don't. You don't care about them that much. I have no idea. So. Yeah, there's not there's not much. I mean, there is the Council Insiders, which is the card that you actually add. Does someone want to read? I like this card art a lot. Oh yeah, I remember this guy. Okay, so this is a psionic guild card with a raid cost of two keys. When you secure a guild card, you may flip the Imperial Council to in session, or you may influence the Imperial Council if it is already in session. Yeah, I think that card is great for you to get. Jamie's not happy. I'm right so now. sorry. I don't even know a word she said. I was just Do touching you think this Christian's is funny? Oh, is this a joke to you? Do you think this is funny? <laughs> It seems like you think it's funny. You're kicked out of the podcast. Oh, okay. <laughs> Do I still have the $50 for killing the fly? Go no. take your fly <laughs> swatter somewhere no. else. Then no. Uh, so Perry didn't hear that. So me and Christian and Jamie Here. will talk about this one. <laughs> it's good for you to get. You definitely don't want the other people to get it, especially outlaws. Uh, so just try and get it when it comes up, if it comes up. Rogue Admirals and Imperial Defectors. We already talked about them at length. They're still important in this act. And then finally, oh, I guess we should talk about the other cards you add. You add Galactic Bards, which, like, it doesn't really matter. I understand why they do it. It's so other people can declare the Imperial-sponsored ambition. Um, but it's not really that relevant to you. It's nice to get. Counts for Keeper, but, like, it's not really worth noting. Navy Reprisal is a Vox card that, when secured, you may resolve the crisis in one cluster you choose, or you may hit all Imperial ships in a cluster you choose. So, probably don't want anyone else to secure that either. Bury this card. What the, is the Crisis in Navy Reprisal? The Crisis says each Imperial ship hits one ship of each outlaw in its system. Fresh ships first, and then bury this card. Okay. Okay, and then the last card is a relatively obscure one. I had to dig through the depths of ArxFates.database, or whatever it's called, to find this card, a Vox card added by a successful warden going into Act 3 called Feast Day. This card allows you to replace rival cities with loyal cities if they have a seat token on them. So if one of your outlaw opponents has their fiefs active, you can then say, hey, it's Feast Day now, I replace it with my own city. I have not played a game with the warden yet, that sounded like complete nonsense. Oh, I forgot. Yeah. <laughs> when Three when nine. Christian... No, no, that was when we played with oh, Ethan. Yeah. When Christian uh, pivoted to the warden, and it was like really, really late at night, and I was starting to lose my mind a little bit, he started reading through all of the stuff that he was going to get the next morning, and I was like... I can't do this. I can't do this. Yeah, now you're <laughs> was, the warden. It was still confusing the next day. So you'll get to see it when we play Act 2, because I'm the warden now. Yeah. She wasn't listening. I taxed her 500 times. It's retribution. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Seems fair. Also, it was fair. notable for this card, there's a funny sketch of the warden holding a big turkey over his head and also holding a fork and knife. So that's fun. It's good. He also has a silly grin. That is pretty silly. One of the best Vox cards, I think. My favorite I is guess Song if... of Freedom. My least favorite is Song of Freedom. Except for Diplomatic Fiasco. Wait, Song of Freedom is like totally worse than Diplomatic Fiasco. You're talking about are you effect or, me? Are we talking about effect or art right now? Effect. 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 You oh. sounded like you were talking... Look, I, I understood from the context that you were talking about the art, but you said very generally like best Vox The Song of Freedom art actually is pretty cool. I do like it. Of course, it's Kyle Farron's art. I like pretty much all of it, but, you know. Christian, can you it's sing cool. a song of freedom for us? <clears throat> <laughs> <laughs> oh, I want to be free. <laughs> That's about all I Amber know. waves of grain. This red roses, too. <laughs> what? <laughs> That sounds like... That's the second or third verse. That sounds like if you asked a first-generation AI that was made, like, in Europe what the national anthem was. And it got none of the lyrics, but it knew a little bit of a different American song, and it just put that in there. Oh, man. Okay. That's what they sing. Yeah. 
All right, so now we move to matchups. And this, gang, is the last section of the first episode of the podcast. Wow. Make it count. Did we not already talk about matchups? I feel like I'm going crazy. No. We talked briefly about pivots. Speaking At the end of, of the last episode. Speaking of matchups. Some of the pivots, namely the naturalist, or yeah, not the blight speaker, the naturalist, you want to watch out for because they want to be the first region. Yep. The gate wraith you want to watch out for because he wants to be the first region. And also it's just crazy and yeah. honestly very strong sea fate. Yeah. If you're up against a sea fate in Act 3, like you got to watch out for that. It doesn't really matter which one it is. That's well, it does true. matter specifically. There are half of the sea fates control about, care about sorry, controlling systems. Half the sea fates care about mm. controlling systems. The fuel guy. As we know, they do not control systems that have Imperial fresh ships in them for the purposes of their objective, unless they're the first region. These are the Overlord, Guardian, Naturalist, and Gate Wraith. Keep an extra keeper peeled for those. An extra an extra keeper. eye for each one of those. Yes. So potentially you need three extra eyes. The steward is actually one of the best fates at growing extra eyes. We've I studied think it's this. probably the blight speaker. Mm, probably the steward, I think. They're just good at everything. I don't know why the magnate seems like he could he could do some some weird stuff. The believer? Eyes. Oh. Oh. He just has to believe it and it becomes true. <laughs> Yeah, I said one of the best, not the best. With Obviously, his wise the eyes. Best. If I can Zealous eyes it, are better. There's mm. nothing to it. We're going to still be talking about the founder here, obviously, because they're inherently opposed to you. They're hostile to the Empire by pretty much definition. Uh, the one nice thing is that their grand ambition is to make sure the Empire doesn't control free cities, not necessarily the founder's loyal cities. So if you just stay away from the free cities, they might decide that imperial occupation of the loyal cities is like a necessary evil and just deal with it. If you can spare it, you still want to be the aggressor because loyal ships are easier to rebuild than imperial ones, especially when the imperial quorum is probably restricting you from actually building those ships back. Redeemer, they scrap relics. You like relics. Beat them up if you can. Not, I don't really think there's anything more to it than that. No. The advocate I kind of put in here is like not really... They don't really add too much, um, but they do add the the law that makes guild card symbols count for double for ambitions, and you have a lot of them. This might be a matchup where you don't have to focus on your grain ambitions as much, so that's worth uh, noting. And then you can spend more of your energy policing sea fates. Just keep out an eye out for Diplomatic Fiasco, which Advocate does, I think, add another copy of as well. Um, and then finally, the Admiral. We've talked about the Admiral so much. If you've ended up as the steward against the Admiral in Act 3 and you don't have Rogue Admirals, it's your own fault. <laughs> you probably won't win, and you knew that it would happen, and it's your own fault. Well played. Good luck. That's all there is to say about that, I don't think. Uh, you really can't score grand ambitions, and you're heavily restricted uh, with martial law in play. No beef hates. Mm -mm. I couldn't really think of any. Um, beef hates. Because the, uh, I mean, I guess the pirate still wants to, but they don't, they don't have to steal anymore. I don't remember what, I, I've been trying to read up on the Peacekeeper Act 3, because I did pivot off of it that mm -hmm. one time. It seemed like they had Pirate started. Grand Ambition is all about their pirate haven yeah the pirate so, grand ambition is fun i can't wait to talk about the pirate yeah the pirate grand ambition actually doesn't affect you at all they still might want to steal stuff because it's fun but like they don't have to anymore so it's not as big of a deal the peacekeeper act three it's those tokens that flip from like yeah peace to they war. uh they make clusters go to peace and they get to make them peace if you from a brief glance at peacekeeper act three it doesn't seem like at least not as relevant as any of the ones I listed. Um, they do care about having systems at peace. I don't remember how they get them at peace. It's like the frogs from Root, I'm told. Yes, it's exactly like the frogs from Root. And the toads, actually. It's comprised of both of them. He kind of looks like he's in like a frog stance. Peacekeeper? Um, yeah, he's a frog-like aura about him, I think. Yeah. I'm I can agree. Greek. So, that brings us to the end of our first episode. We talked about the steward today and we had a lot of fun. At least I did. And I hope you did too, dear viewer or listener, if you're not looking at us, because really, why would you want to? Um, the hat. Whoa. That is messed up. 
Why? It's a podcast. A lot of people don't look at the podcast. To be clear, they're probably eating. It's an audio medium. They might be washing the dishes or something. Or, yeah, doing dishes. Maybe even Mowing the No, no doing dryer. dishes. If you're doing dishes right now, stop. I listen to podcasts <laughs> in my sleep, so I definitely wouldn't be looking. If you're sleeping right now, wake please up. Please look at us. Sweet dreams. <laughs> okay. No, I nightmare, said it was nightmare, messed up nightmare. that Cole said, why would you want to look? That's the only thing that I I, so. because they're probably doing something else. I am going to now activate all the sleeper agents who are currently sleeping by saying their secret code passphrase that will wake them up but there's and multiple so you have to just say yeah yeah we're, the, the next 10 minutes will be us like <laughs> reading out several passphrases but screaming them it just so <laughs> yeah yeah that's, have to scream it them. does have to wake them up too yeah uh or else it doesn't work obviously um omaha board sarajevo <laughs> cadillac 1933. Your voice is really good at doing that. Thank you. Green. Bottle. Mountain. Okay, this is a mem- Now, go back and we're going to say the words. We're going to we're gonna put the words back up. You have to remember all the words in order. How many words can you remember? It's the first oh part of the secret code that spans our 24 episode series. Holy oh shit. My God. The first part is Green Mountain Bottle 1933 Cadillac Sarajevo <laughs> Omaha. Omaha. <laughs> okay. Anvil. Let's end this episode. I feel like it's been really long. What do you guys think about the steward now that we've finished discussing them? Love the card art. Yeah, Jamie um, really likes the card art. If you catch your drift, um, I feel like <sighs> the steward is deal makers. That's, That's good. Steel steel makers, basically. Uh, the steward who has deal makers is what I was, I guess, going to say. They're fun to play. Not fun to play. Not against. fun to play against. And since Paris never played them, he doesn't like them. But I think they're fun to play, honestly. Yeah, there's I mean, nothing I love more than being the first regent. And collecting taxes and stuff like that. Keep that and in it's mind. basically free when you're playing the steward. I'll keep that in mind for next time. Okay. I guess it's cool. I feel like you if don't you bend s- our parking pass. Yeah, stop either. putting our address on the screen too. You have to blur it out. If you set up correctly for the steward, and I feel like the matchups are a bigger deal than I've realized because no one's ever become an outlaw in our group. Like basically ever. There have been some outlaw but times, like but very barely. Few. It like barely does anything. I feel like it would be, it, like it seems nice to play, and that you have a lot of options. Like there's so many pivots that you can do. It's just deal makers. Yeah. <laughs> it's just deal makers. I'm like, deal come back. I'm like, pivots. why is it good? Oh. Half the fun of playing the steward is leaving them after Act One to pursue a new fun future with your broken card. Yeah, and on, on the outlaw thing, I think, like, outlaws become a lot stronger when there's more than one. And so, like, if I think I want to become an outlaw, I think my new, like, kind of MO is going to be trying to convince someone else that it's also good to become an outlaw. And then we, we're kind of in it together against the two Imperial people. I'll never believe you, though. And if it's me that you're talking to? The first regent gets less benefit if there's more outlaws from taxing. And the ones that are still getting taxed are, like, getting specifically targeted. And then it's like could be like a domino effect, you know? I'll only believe you if, you're if believer. I'm the believer. And then I saw her face. So horrible. That is cut out. So that horrible. is not in. That so pink the mic so bad. It blew out everyone's eardrums. <laughs> Why did you do that? I Your did face cut went it out. red. Like, I got really excited. Yeah, that's not in the... Or maybe I'll just leave it in, it. but I'll just mute yes. the audio. <laughs> it was really loud. Or I'll drop it like to the minimum volume <laughs> level. Episode 8 is going to have to be a real banger, the way you guys keep talking about Believer. We are going to have... It's actually... You know, I won't spoil the surprise. We'll talk about this after we wrap up. I'm actually not going to do any prep for Believer because prep happens in the heart. And so when we get to the sections where I'm like, what are the notable cards? You guys will then tell me what they are. From my heart. No, from the from looking at them and preparing it. Believer man. I will say the cards. notable cards <laughs> are the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9 uh, faithful cards. Mm. And that's, that's all. I'm Actually right. extremely important to the Believer's <laughs> game. <laughs> you wouldn't believe. Guild yeah. cards too. No, it's true. They're notable. I would take note of them. Anyway, Not worthy even. it's time to end this episode the way we end every episode. 
Jamie? She looked really ready to do it. She I was like inhaling. Know what it was. She was inhaling. Didn't we talk about this last time? Didn't I didn't remember that? anything. I don't know. Maybe. What did we say? The way that we end every episode is by collectively snapping the other. <laughs> is this a slam poetry reading? Jamie has the worst rhythm of anybody I've ever met. She cannot snap at the same time. Okay, as here's else. what we do. The way that we end the episode is we go around the table and we <laughs> do a round of winks at the person to our left and see and see. <laughs> a round of winks. Yeah. <laughs> Potentially audio based medium. Yeah. Well, it's going to go on YouTube. So if you want the full experience, <laughs> wake up. Wake up. <laughs> wake up for the full experience first. We put our and hands stop in. doing the dishes. Why are you sleeping and doing the dishes? That's fucking psychotic. We, we put our hands in and we go one, two, three, and then we say the word that most comes to mind with the fate that we're talking about. And then we, we break. And then it cuts. So Hard cut. Okay. Cool. Hard cut. But first, we have to wink at everyone. Oh yeah, sorry. This is gonna be the two minute wink break. If you're li- if you're only listening, just we'll come back in a second. <laughs> no one is watching this. They turned it off fifteen minutes ago. All right, do the wink. That was the eye that's not facing the camera. They won't know. You didn't wink at Jamie! No, I give it to the viewers. Okay, viewers, everyone wink at Jamie. (laughs) Wake up, stop doing the dishes, and wink at Jamie. Those are your three prime directives for when you're woken as a secret sleeper agent. (laughs) Cool root channel sleeper agent. Cool root channel sleeper agent. (laughs) That was really good. I liked that one. Yeah. I liked the wink that they did at me. It was good. All right, right, hands in, everybody, and say the name, the word... That comes, that comes to mind, to mind with, with the name Stewart. Ready? We're going one, two, three, yeah. bang. Okay. Okay. One, two, three. Blue. Sarah Yevo. Oh. I was hoping everyone would do the secret agent phrase. No. Oh. Uh, we can do it for real now. I just said no, mine for real. What did you say? Well, if you didn't hear it, oh that's fine. Oh my god. <laughs> can do it again. <sighs> we'll put it in the overlay. Oh my god, this is a mess. All right. I have to do this every time. It'll be faster. I have to think of a word this time. Okay. Hold on. Holding. I'm thinking. <laughs> I'm thinking. I'm thinking. All right, I'm ready. One, two, two three. three. Empire. Empire. God damn it. You said Sarajevo. <laughs> I switched. I thought you were going to stick. <laughs> no, I said <laughs> this. All right, let's oh, do okay. it. So we'll combine the two of them together. We'll superimpose them into one eight person chorus in which two of the people are saying Sarajevo. So you'll probably I hear that the, the most. thing both times. Me what too. What did you say? It's a blue. Deal makers. Blue. I said deal makers the first time. Yeah. So you could harmonize that and then. We have to deal keep. We have to keep. Okay. Deal makers. Deal makers. Deal makers. Deal makers. Deal makers. That was good. Uh, okay. What we actually have to do is everyone picks a word. If we say that, if anyone says the same word, we have to go again. But no one can pick a word that was already said, and we keep going until everyone says a unique word. I don't like that. End of episode. Thanks for watching. <laughs> Oh god, he's gotta get out. Oh no! <laughs> the actual end of the episode is watch cold. <laughs>